It's been one year since the US withdrew troops from Afghanistan. The chaotic withdrawal angered its European allies who were left with no choice but to do the same. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February gave their relationship a shot in the arm, brought closer by a common threat. The tensions have grown between America and China over Taiwan's sovereignty, and there's a global energy crisis to deal with. Will all this get in the way of repairing frayed ties with Europe? Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. U.S. President Joe Biden promised his administration would rebuild that transatlantic relationship, one severely tested during the Trump era. But barely a month after the last U.S. troops had left Afghanistan, he announced the AUKUS nuclear submarine pact with Australia and the U.K. Europeans took this as a signal that the U.S. was more interested in squaring up to China than fostering better relations with them. France's Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian didn't mince his words, calling the U.S. move, quote, a stab in the back. But with a shared aim to defeat Russia in Ukraine, will this improve U.S. and Europe relations longer term? Well, joining me now to discuss all of this, we have from North Carolina in the U.S., Professor Klaus Lattis, Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And here in the studio, Dennis McShane, former UK Minister for Europe, and Robert Fox, defense editor at the Evening Standard. Good to have you all uh, with us. Dennis McShane, if I could start with you, how would you assess the current state of relations then between uh, the United States and Europe right now? I think between the administration and the governments of Europe, it, it's, it's very good. The curiosity about the United States is that there used to be a famous saying that politics stops at the water's edge. In other words, Americans have great domestic political arguments, but once it's an international problem, they're united. This time we're seeing the Republicans, and particularly Donald Trump, almost saying that President Joe Biden is a bigger threat to democracy and the world peace and stability and humanity than Vladimir Putin. And that's a big problem. There are some differences between different European countries, but not seriously. I actually think uh, that Putin's done the West or the Euro-Atlantic community and their allies around the world, like Japan, Australia, Korea, and so on, uh, a great service because he's, he's presented us with a very clear menace and threat that we have to take on and overcome if we want to defend our way of life. Robert Fox, what's your take on this? Follow um, uh, Dennis uh, as on much of these matters, Euro Atlantic. And I think that a factor that Putin must recognize but not like to is there is a great deal of pragmatism going on behind the scenes. We had a big hurrah um, from the EU saying yes, that they were thinking of doing a joint EU training package for Ukraine. But everybody there knew that the Europeans, sponsored by the Americans, and the British particularly, with the Poles and the Baltics, have been getting on with an awful lot of training. And in the British and American case, and particularly the British in the lead, it's been going on since 2014. And so I agree. Um, there's a lot of hot air in the headlines uh, at the moment, which seem to me, from talking to sources, and I've just been talking to a source uh, who has wonderful contacts right across uh, Eastern Europe, into Russia, I I I into the Black Sea, into the Caucasus. And the picture that you get once you lift the curtain is so very, very different. I agree with Dennis, too, that this has galvanized resolve. It has given NATO, particularly, a new sense of purpose. And Talk the about the war in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the grown-up part of... NATO and the grown-up part of the EU in security and foreign policy and defence realise they've got to grow together and work together. They cannot work apart. But it has brought America and the UK, it must be said, back into Europe and European security in a way you might not have imagined a year or two ago when you got Boris Johnson with his famous or infamous tilt uh, to the Pacific, uh, global Britain. 
There's still a lot of hot air about that, but it is just that. It's hot air. All right. Well, before we get a view uh, from across the Atlantic, we, we want to hear from um, the US President uh, Joe Biden, who uh, um, spoke earlier this year on this. Uh, US President Joe Biden and uh, Spain's King Felipe um, talked about the importance of unity as they met ahead of the NATO summit uh, back in June in Madrid. Today, NATO is united and as united and galvanized as I believe it's ever been. And uh, we are ready to face the threats of Russian aggression because, quite frankly, there's no choice. It's been a, uh, the most significant abuse of power since World War II and an invasion of that many people into another country in Europe. Some people thought that was not likely to happen again, but it did. But we responded. Klaus Laris, what did, did the war in Ukraine then bring, bring the two closer together? Yes, absolutely. As has been said before, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine gave NATO a new life. It gave the Western alliance a new coherence. But ever since Joe Biden replaced uh, Donald Trump in the White House, I think there has been a very strong transatlantic realignment. Uh, the Europeans were so relieved that Trump wasn't uh, re-elected, but that a transatlantic, an old transatlantic uh, sympathizer like Joe Biden got to the White House, that they gave him a lot of support right from the beginning. And, of course, the Ukraine war and Russia's aggression uh, uh, continued uh, to do that. And the Europeans are fairly united so far. There are the usual outliers. There is uh, Hungary, Poland, perhaps a new right-wing government in Italy will come into being. They are the skeptics. They uh, wonder whether it would be really sensible to uh, continue the war and to support the transatlantic alliance, including NATO, as has been done in the recent few months. But uh, I think the majority of the EU countries, and particularly Germany and France, are strongly behind Joe Biden, and they do do not want to give in. They want to continue fighting the Ukraine war as long as the Ukrainians want to do so. Dennis McShane, how do you see this relationship going forward? The longer the war in Ukraine goes on, the longer there is no chance of, of any um, source of, sort, of, sort of a decisive end to this and it becomes this war of attrition. Energy prices uh, continue to hit people hard throughout Europe. Do you think you see strains there? There will be strains, but also... Never let a crisis go to waste. Take energy, for example. That's really forcing people to rethink what is the source of our energy? How do we move quicker to not being dependent on fossil fuels, namely particularly gas and, 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 and oil, pe petrol? So that's accelerating. I mean, there's real resources going into fusion, nuclear fusion, big scientific subject, but uh, there's a lot of bright young people and a lot of big money going into that. We crack that, that will be a huge breakthrough. War does that. I mean, the Second World War started with us flying around in biplanes. It finished with rockets crossing seas to land on, on, on London. And very shortly, we were, we were on the moon, as it were. So that, that I think, is happening. The second thing is that uh, it's a huge boost for the defence industry. Because what the Ukrainians are saying, a bit like Winston Churchill, give us the tools, we'll finish the job. And so you're now getting France sending nearly a quarter of its highest level howitzer, real Russian killers. Now, the French don't want to talk about it, but the French are killing a lot more Russians than Boris Johnson has, despite all his high-profile visits to Kiev. The Americans have just signed off on a huge mega-billion-pound deal. It takes time to produce arms. I mean, it took two or three years after 1939 before the Allies actually had decent, good equipment. The Russians are digging in. They've tried to turn this into a First World War conflict. They're digging deep, deep, deep. That means they can't attack. It means also their soldiers don't get killed. But actually, when you start playing defensive this early in a war, that means you have the faintest idea of how to win it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how the, the war in Ukraine has, has forced Europe to, to, to reassess its own uh, military infrastructure. We're going to hear from Joseph Borrell, the uh, European uh, foreign policy chief, EU foreign policy chief. He says, the, with the return of war to European soil, all of us in Europe must contribute more actively to taking responsibility for our own security. The strategic compass will provide a framework for using these additional means, ensuring full 
complementarity with uh, NATO. So Joseph Borrell saying there that this has forced us as well to sort of get our own house in, in order, regardless of the relationship between the United States. Do you think it's, it's done a bit of that as well? Yes, it's interesting, because I think it's been a bit of a corrective to the often misquoted uh, remark uh, by Emmanuel Macron that um, NATO uh, was brain dead. It was a typical flashy Macron remark. But what he really meant was quite sensible, is that NATO at that point was, uh, could be, have been accused of strategic drift. By that, strategy is politics, is policy at the high end. And, the, and there was a, that sense uh, of drift, of lack of purpose. As we've all been saying, there's a real sense of purpose now. And it's very interesting what Burrell has been saying. No, we're not going to try and di displace or replace. We are there to complement, to, uh, to help and assist. Because when you look at the funding for things like the common security and defence uh, um, dimension of uh, the EU and PESCO, things like that, these, these cooperative uh, uh, arrangements uh, and structures, the funding, if I may use the expression, is really quite piddling. For a, a, a large alliance like the EU to be spending 5 billion euros on the EDA, the European Develop uh, Defence Agency, it's really not that much. It's a, even a minimal part of the British uh, defence equipment budget uh, 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 over the next 10 years. But I do agree with Dennis on this. There is a new sense of pragmatism. And it's very interesting what he was saying about France. The British are in a parallel situation and are going about it in a rather different way. The British army particularly suffered very badly from Iraq and above all Afghanistan. It needs to re-equip. It also needs uh, to reform. And actually, they're using the vehicle of their assistance to Ukraine to facilitate that, to catalyze it, to help. I think you'll see some common ac acquisitions where they will be buying in new equipments because the stocks have been run down drastically. And part of it will be going to Ukraine. How they're going to sell that to the British electorate is going to be very interesting, but I think that that's the next phase. Uh, Klaus Laris, how do you see this transatlantic relationship in, in military terms going forward then? I think the greatest shock to the system was for the Germans. The Germans have, in energy policy, uh, followed a very strong policy of engagement with the Russians since uh, the 1970s. And in military terms, they, of course, are under, still under shock from the Second World War and have adopted a very pacifistic attitude to military and defense issues. And both were overturned by Putin's invasion in late February of this year. So for the Germans in particular, the shock was profound. Found. And when uh, Chancellor uh, Scholz uh, announced his Zeitenwende, his change of times in late February of this year, he mended and he knew that it was utterly necessary. However, the German government and particularly the German people find it actually difficult to get used to that Zeitenwende, to, to a different age in both energy policy and militaristic defense policy terms. And the government itself as well, but particularly the German people. I do not doubt that it will be implemented, that the Germans will no, not go back uh, to the times before February of this year, but it will take some time and it probably will take longer than the NATO allies would like them to take. Uh, the Germans have a very deeply ingrained pacifistic nature. And I think the danger is if there was now a pause in the Ukraine war or some sort of temporary settlement exactly. was achieved, that the Germans would basically say, let's go back to as the way it was. Let's forget about that, uh, that fighting and all that militaristic attitude. Perhaps our previous policy of being you know, a more pacifistic country was right after all. I think that is the danger, that a lull in the fighting may lead to a return to the old ways. That explains an that? awful lot of what's going on on the battlefield at the moment. I absolutely agree with you. Um, Zelensky was advised by his senior staff not to go for a big uh, a, a offensive uh, person. But in fact, he insisted on it. In fact, they almost came to fisticuffs. A, a very good source told me at one, uh, one closed-door meeting because he said, you've got to do it. We've got to show that we are seizing the initiative because I am very worried about support from... Europe. I'd just like to add a rider to what we've said. Watch what's going on in the Italian G20 
general election campaign. It is absolutely fascinating because there is quite a big peace movement there, particularly coming from the right. They're not quite united on the messaging, but the message being sold to the Italian public is we, the Italians, for our long-term relationship with Russia, ENI, we are big buyers of Russian gas, we probably know how to fix it. And I think it's that initiative which is destined for the swiftest failure. And I think that will, that will come very interesting within months or weeks of the new Italian government coming in but at the yet, end of but September. Yet, but yet, the probable, we don't know, but very possible next Italian Prime Minister, Giorgio Meloni, whose party in its origins is descended from Mussolini, but it's not, you know, they're not mm. black shirts and squadristi marching around Milan and Rome. She actually, as she sniffs power, she's dropped her anti-EU line. She's dropped her anti-Euro line. And she's certainly backing NATO and Ukraine to the hilt because she, I mean, she, she does smell politics and she realises the old right-wing line, which was actually quite strong in Germany too. It used to be a left-wing line to be, let's all be friends with mm -hmm. Russia. You know, it's been a right-wing line of late. It won't work with the public. The, Brit the European public doesn't trust Putin. They're all cele celebrating the wrong word, commemorating the death or the loss of Mikhail Gorbachev and see him as the good Russian. And now we've got the bad Russian back again. And they know Putin is a menace to everything that matters in terms of European values. And that, that actually, as I say, I always want Putin to keep going for a bit longer because he's doing marvels in bringing Europe and the United States together. Well, we talked a lot uh, up to this point yeah. about how the war in Ukraine has affected the, the, the relations and you know, brought them closer together, at least initially. But we are in the, uh, it's, it's one year since the uh, withdrawal of Afghanistan uh, this week. And that was something that really uh, left a lot of America's European allies um, uh, disgruntled about the way the whole thing was handled, how they felt they weren't consulted, and they had no, chase, no choice but to, to withdraw um, as well. There's still a lot of um, repair to be done there as well, isn't there? I think there is. But um, it was a bad and very dirty trick. It, it was a very silly trick, uh, instigated by Trump and Khalil Zaid, his, uh, his, his, his representative. It was a bad deal because it was, it, there, there were secret aspects to it, and possibly the secret aspects were negotiated with the wrong guys who weren't or couldn't, uh, couldn't deliver. Let's not go into detail there. There was a failure of trust, and there is uh, the common inference that Putin thought, well, the West is not going to do anything, so I'll go into Ukraine. Absolutely not. Ukraine had been planned and thought of by Putin years before. I'm not speaking out of turn here. It's absolutely clear. British and American intelligence, which work cheek by jowl, absolutely were spotting this coming up post-2014 and, 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 and Crimea. But, you know, it, it is a war. The, the, the people who, who, who are advising and are helping uh, Ukraine realized that, and, and, and I think a, 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 a lot of the finger jabbing, oh, you said this and we did that, that, that is out of the window because under, under the covers, there's an awful lot of cooperation uh, going on. And the people who have become crucial are the East Europeans, both in the EU and NATO. That, but, and that is the real fear, that they could become vulnerable to whatever Putin might do next should he get a weak, a soft deal. Out of Ukraine. Imagine, look, what is one of the big things Gorbachev is remembered for? He cut Russian losses in Afghanistan. He yeah. pulled the army out. He said, what are we, a northern, if you like, Christian, white, if you like, European power doing in Afghanistan? We can't do anything. We in the West then made three huge strategic errors of going in for regime change interventions first in Iraq, then in Libya, then in Syria. And we're still suffering from immigrant and refugee and asylum seeker waves that are causing huge problems for every West European country. So yes, uh, Bush confirmed the Trump decision. We all remember the helicopter on the embassy of the US in Vietnam. Well, old, old, older people like me and Robert do, not you young guys. Um, <laughs> but actually, it was the best thing that America did. 
America came back to life after that, and it was actually very good for Vietnam. And we still haven't realized that don't send your kinetic force, your armies into countries that have got nothing to do with you, pose no threat to you. They may be horrible inside, disgusting inside. And uh, I think, actually, if anything, uh, the uh, Putin invasion has slightly shunted to one side the, the, the little rows, the tensions, yeah, the edginess sure. over yeah. Afghanistan. And people now are focusing on how do we beat Putin. And the best military strategic minds, the famous military industrial complex that President Eisenhower talked of, is now back in harness, trying to work out without sending any foreign European or American troops, how do we defeat Putin? And Putin's defeat will be a great win for world democracy and peace. Um, Klaus Laris, what's, what's your uh, reaction to all of that? And, and um, I want to ask you as well about this perceived trust deficit that many European partners still have with the, with the United States uh, over Afghanistan and other issues. I think the decision about uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan was not that controversial, but the way how it was right. done is yeah. and remains very controversial. It clearly was messy and chaotic and really very unbecoming for the world's only superpower. And I think Biden is still suffering from that, certainly among the American public. It, he, it may not have repercussions for the forthcoming midterm elections because it was a year ago and the American political memory doesn't tend to be all that long but still you know he personally is seen as having had certain weaknesses in afghanistan as has his entire team all right let's let's move just in a couple of minutes that we've got left i want to move on to to china um and and how there are, there are differences there between the europe and the us and the perception among many, Euro many european partners that they feel that they're being sidelined because of american focus on on how to deal with china yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, this is very Anglo-Saxon headline. Um, if you go, my wife's Dutch. Um, I spend a lot of time in Italy. Um, the relationship between China and Europe is profound and deep, so much so that my friend Lucio Caracciolo, uh, founder of Lima, it's a magazine, very highly reputed magazine, says that China is virtually a prime European power in, uh, in terms of trade. In terms of trade, it certainly so is, is there, so. So is there common and so, ground? And they look can at find? there's an extraordinary essay by Ian Bremmer in the current Economist, and the, as the Italians say, the intreccia, the entanglement of China both with the U.S. and and with Europe, means that, that they probably won't be sundered. And his thing is profound, given the tensions that Dennis has so rightly alluded to, the things that are coming up with climate change. Uh, demography and, and so on, the real pressure is going to be north-south. And that's where China and America and Europe are going to be more or less uh, uh, um, aligned, not allied. And this is where Putin's Russia is so extraordinary for such a fast country. It's such a piddling economy by, uh, by comparison with its size and its natural resources. What is it, Dennis? It's roughly the size of Spain, isn't it? It's, the, 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 it's the, tiny, Russian, tiny. The, 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 the Russian economy. I think there is a lot uh, uh, going on. And the cliche about, uh, yes, they've, before the Winter Olympics, they talked about eternal friendship, uh, Xi and, and, and Putin. Gosh, how much assistance has China uh, given Russia since the Ukraine crisis began? in February this year. Jury's out. I am not so oh. sure. I think China, particularly with the United Nations condemnation uh, oh, of uh, committing crimes against humanity, against Muslims uh, in, in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, yes. that was published today. This is extraordinary. China sets a great deal of store by UN rule of law. It always says, we're the good boys. We follow UN rules. It's the wicked Americans and the Anglo-Saxons who violate the United Nations Charter. Now, China is in the dock. Xi is an old man in a hurry. Uh, I think he's made a great strategic mistake by lining up with Putin. Uh, and we'll, we'll see. I am not convinced. In Italy, it's true. If you go to any tiny village or town, there's a shop called Kida, which means China. Uh, and it's where you get all the cheap stuff. Uh, in that sense, it's true. Uh, 
And Marco the, Polo. The, 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 if you like, spaghetti it comes from China. We all know that. That said, uh, I think people love cheap Chinese goods. Happy to have Chinese investment to and uh, investment into China, but they're getting more and more worried about this turn to the worst kind of old totalitarian politics. And in that sense, Xi, who seems to be imitating Putin, and it, mm. he's backed by all of the Chinese communist authorities, there's trouble ahead. All right, that is going to have to be uh, the last word. We are just about out of time. Thank you. Uh, to all three of you, uh, Klaus Laris in uh, North Carolina, Dennis McShane and Robert Fox uh, here in the studio with me in London. Thanks very much for being on Roundtable. And remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye. Thanks for watching.